Brian O'Connell. Welcome to The Give and Go. Welcome to the second episode of The Give and Go. My name is Brian O'Connell, editor, writer at New England Soccer Today, joined here by Julian Cardillo from Boston.com. And today we're going to talk about the Dempsey signing. We're also going to talk about transfer rumor, lots of transfer rumors out there concerning players for the revolution. We're also going to talk about a preview of Saturday's Sporting KC game versus New England Revolution. It'll be the first time the Revolution will play in Sporting KC. So we're going to talk about those three topics. So the first thing we're going to get into right now is we're going to talk about Clint Dempsey saga. Obviously, you know, he, was, he, he was in the English Premier League, you know, left the Revs 2007, went over to play for Fulham before going over to Tottenham. And now he's back, I think, a lot sooner than a lot of us thought. I mean, Julian, what, what was your take on the whole Dempsey situation? I have to be honest, I was surprised. I thought uh, he was doing very well in the EPL. I thought he had a really good stint with Fulham. I thought uh, maybe not his best year with Tottenham, but um, you know, certainly uh, very satisfactory from Dempsey last year. Um, he was a guy who scored in two World Cups, a guy who's played well in the Europa League, who has aspirations to play in Champions League. So I think absolutely it's incredibly surprising that someone of that stock is is coming back to MLS, and uh, I think it's a wonderful statement for, for the league. I was a little surprised, you know, he's been doing so well, and um, you know, I've talked to him quite a bit, um, you know, in the summer, but uh, yeah, wasn't expecting him to come back as soon as he was, you know, I, I knew at some point he was going to come back, but, um, but you know, I, I don't blame him, you know, he's got, he's got a family, he's got his kids, and he's got, uh, he's got to look towards the future as well, so, I mean, uh, it was a great move um, for him, a great move for Seattle, a great move for this league, so I'm happy, I'm happy for him. Um, he's going to be great for this league again. Um, I think it says a lot about him and how he views and values MLS. If you look back to 2006 when he was sold, um, he was in the third year of his deal. Um, you know, he made it very clear at the time that, that he had, had aspirations and dreams to play in Europe. And um, you know, both the Revs and the league felt that at the time the, the offer was substantial enough to move him prior to the end of his contract, um, to which we did. And that's obviously the reason why we didn't have right first refusal um, when he came back into the league this time. And you talked about what kind of impact this has had on the league. Is this a good thing for the league, the way that it was done where the league basically paid for the transfer fee? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, in general, I think it, it's really great for the league when you have someone like Dempsey come over. I mean, he's a, a player of uh, extremely great class. Um, I think the mechanisms that were used to bring him over, I think those are a little bit more questionable. I think we're going to start to see uh, in the coming months or the coming years that um, reporters and fans and admirers of MLS are going to want to see some more transparency uh, you know, in regards to how players are acquired. Uh, MLS released a statement after Dempsey signing concerning the allocation process and you know, how he was sort of you know, removed from, uh, from that standard of how you'd bring players back. Uh, and I think there are a lot of questions here about you know, the league paying for transfer fees. I mean, who, who else have other elite teams gone after uh, and decided to not pull the trigger on because of the transfer fees. So maybe you look at a team like, you know, maybe the Revolution, for example, and let's just say they want to bring in a player like Steven Gerrard. Does the league step in and pay the transfer fee, or are the Revs all alone? I think, I think this is a little bit of a muddy uh, precedent to be, to be set. Um, and so while the, the move for Dempsey is really great for the league, really great for him, really great for Seattle Sounders FC, I think it leaves a lot of questions as to how players are going to be acquired in the future uh, from MLS to MLS. And I think that's really the biggest question. I think any time we hear a move or any time we see a rumor, the question will always be like, well, is the league going to pay for that transfer fee just as they had? Because like you said, it, it sets a very tricky precedent as far as the league stepping in and saying, we're going to pay the transfer fee to help out one club, not all clubs. So uh, that's a very interesting question. And obviously with that news, there's also the news of the, you know, the, transfer, the transfer rumor, the transfer rumors, the transfer mill. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of names being thrown out there. A few guys on the revolution. Uh, one of them is Juan Agudelo, a guy that a lot of people don't expect to be here next year. Um, and already, we're already hearing about rumors to Stoke um, and where, how long he's going to be here for. Whether that that contract starts at the end of the at the end of his contract here, or whether he leaves on a leaves on a transfer. Revolution's awesome. I'm with them right now, and I'm going to, you know, play for whoever teams I'm under contract with right now. And right now, 110 percent, my focus is on getting healthy and playing with the Revolution. Aspirations to go abroad, or do you see yourself as an MLS player? Um, right now I'm just focused on playing with the Revolution, but um, I mean, everybody knows what I signed. 
Uh, you know, what, what kind of what kind of things is do you think it serves as a distraction for a team like the Revs who are in the middle of a playoff run? Uh, I think from a staff perspective, uh, you you just focus on the next game ahead. They have to play Kansas City in a few days, and that's a huge game. And we know that this team is is uh, in the heat of a playoff race. They want that spot, and I think uh, they're going to do all they can to uh, minimize the distraction. I think that's what they have to do. If they make the distraction a big issue, then I mean they're going to have to kiss uh, those play playoff chances goodbye. And obviously, he's a player of really great stock. Um, he's got great talent. He's young. He's proven at the international level. And Stoke City is a team that, that has proven to really like American players. I mean, we have uh, Jeff Cameron there now, Maurice Adu, Rex Shea. So I think the trend that they're following is, is pretty consistent. And you know, I think this would be a, a great move for Juan Agadello. Um, my understanding is that his contract with MLS would expire in December, so he would be able to go to the Premier League then. But there also uh, maybe could be um, some kind of a, an agreement where Juan Agadello maybe goes a little earlier. Um, and obviously he's still nursing a knee injury that, um, you know, he's very close to coming back. But I'm sure Stoke will be monitoring that too. We're wearing these heart rate monitors and um, I think this week um, I've got the info that I've been, you know, almost as level to some of the players that, you know, substitutes that are um, playing on the team. So I think it's really good right now. I feel like if it was tomorrow, I feel like I could play 90. He said if the game was tomorrow, he'd go 90. He feels like he's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not, not his decision. decision. It's not my decision. Yeah. It's not his decision. It's not my decision. You know, I think, I think it's, you know, we, we have a medical staff that, um, you know, is looking out for the best interest of the player. And, uh, you know, I think for him, he's, he's so close. You know, he's getting there. But we, we're, we're, uh, Want to be, want to be patient, want to be smart, and, you know, because we, we need him for this, this stretch, this stretch for the playoffs, because uh, we need all of our forwards, and we play three of them at a time, and uh, we need to have you know, guys that can rotate in all three of those slots, and, and that's what he does well. He's really the most versatile, probably. He and Chad, are, you know, to play on the lane at that time. I think it'll be interesting to see in the next few weeks how much more news comes out of Juan Agudelo. So far, the Revs have been very quiet. I cannot imagine the Revs being quiet until December. It's just, I just don't think it's going to happen. Sooner or later, someone's going to open their mouths about something, and we're going to learn what's going on with Juan. It would surprise me if the Revs said anything, and that, that's a great point. I think, uh, you know, silence is a good thing as far as they go, because uh, they want to limit those distractions, and Jay Heaps and Mike Burns are actually very, very good at kind of keeping things under the lid, and in fact, you know, Mike Burns talked to talk to us uh, prior to the prior to the Toronto FC game about the Clint Dempsey situation. He was surprised that they were actually keep they were able to keep such a huge deal like that on the lids up until maybe the time it was announced. I mean, there was rumors out there, but it was pretty. It wasn't as as crazy or as 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 frantic as as we would have normally have expected for a player of his caliber to come to a league like this. So, um, kind of going off to uh, another player who's on the transfer uh, scene is uh, Sarah Sen. Uh, there have been rumors about him possibly moving to so uh, Sochaux. Uh, you know, he looks like another player that won't leave until the end of the year. Uh, well, what's nice about Sen is that he's a young player, and I think teams in France see that. You know, he's, he's French-born. He has experience with the Bayern Munich uh, second team. He's done very well in MLS with the Revolution, uh, so I think he continues to prove himself. I think that's another player who goes uh, maybe in the winter, or maybe the Rebs maybe negotiate a contract, try to get him to stay a little bit longer, but that's certainly another player who has excellent stock, excellent value. Um, you wouldn't be uh, surprised to see him go. Um, and he's not the only one. I mean, Jerry Bankson is attracting uh, some rumors from Greece this week. Uh, before Khalifa Sisse was, uh, um, his, his contract was, was uh, parted ways with uh, earlier this week. That was another one, maybe going to the uh, second division in England. Uh, so you don't want to say the Revs are, are getting gutted here, but certainly more transfer news circulating around them than we've seen in, in many years, which is very interesting. It is very interesting, and it's a very interesting situation for the Revs because of the fact not only are they on the playoff hunt, but these are players that are not you know, leaving you know, two years from now. These are players whose contracts expire at the end of the year, so when they make any kind of move to bring somebody in to replace a guy like Agudela or a guy like Sen or you know, any other player that, that, that's at the center of the rumor mill, they also have to think about next year. So you're not only thinking about replacements for this year, but you're thinking about the possibility that these players probably one way or another won't be here next year. So it'll be very, very interesting to see how the Revs handle that and who they bring in. Now we've talked about players that are rumored to be going out. Now let's talk about players that are rumored to be coming in. And that'd be Louis Saha and Charlie Davies. Uh, you know, two, diff two different kinds of players, almost in the sense that one, one, will bring, one will give you almost an immediate impact with Louis Saha. Somebody 
like Charlie Davies. Maybe needs a little bit of time to kind of get the rust off. He really hasn't played much um, over for Randers. So uh, what, what would be the impact of each, in, in your opinion? Uh, well, let's take Louis Saha first. I think, uh, you know, age is definitely a question. He's 34 years old, but uh, you can't discount experience. You know, he's played in the Italian Serie A and the EPL. He's had some pretty good success with teams over there. Um, and, you know, he's a, he's a pretty good professional. I look at this as a short-term sort of thing just because of his age. I look at him and I see a mirror image of maybe Edgar Sankauskas or Usman Dabo mm -hmm. and their contributions to the revolution. Obviously, they're great players in their own right, but how much can they help the team right away? So uh, we've actually seen the Saha rumors maybe fall off a little bit. I don't know if the Rebs were in talk with him. Uh, maybe they were. I think, like I said, he'd be a short-term acquisition. Charlie Davies, on the other hand, is uh, he's a little bit more intriguing. Uh, I think... You know, everyone knows his history, the, the uh, tragic car accident that limited and basically took away his time with the U.S. national team. I think that really affected the player he became. I think worth noting, though, is that he's from the Boston area. He's from Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, and he's a, he's a relatively experienced player. You know, he's right now in the, Den in the Danish league, played in France. Uh, he had really high value for a little while. I think, like you said, Charlie Davies left to get that rust off. I do not think he's going to be a Syerson or Juan Agudelo right off the bat. I think this is going to be a long-term thing, and I think he's going to have to really grow with the revolution, mesh with the coaching staff, and then rediscover some of his old form. Whether that form comes back, I'm not sure. I also think it's worth noting, you look at the Revs players, the Revs forwards that, that are you know on the roster right now, they're all relatively young. I mean, Diego Fagundes, young. Syerson, young. Uh, Jerry Benson is young. Juan Agudelo is young. None of these guys are over 30. And I think there's something to be said about getting the most from these young players. Um, obviously, some of these guys are you know, maybe on their way out and you'd like to see more of them. But I think this is a trend you may want to continue, is getting these young players that can make a difference for the team. Now, to go from the transfer talk and players who, are, who we just talked to who are possibly coming here, uh, the more pressing issue right now, I think, for the team is their game against KC on, on Saturday. Uh, a KC team that lost for the last two. Uh, and a KC team that's also playing uh, Champions League soccer tonight in uh, Nicaragua. So uh, what do the Revs have to do, in your opinion, to, uh, to come out of Sporting KC Park with three points or, or a point? Well, I think they have to definitely manage the crowd, manage the environment. Uh, sporting uh, KC Park is, is one of the, the toughest venues to play uh, on the road. And uh, the Revolution have actually shown this year, in my opinion, that they do very well against top teams. And I would consider Kansas City one of them. Uh, but this Kansas City team is incredibly confident. I mean, they have depth at every position, and their players are, are doing very, very well. I mean, uh, Matt Beasler and Aurelian Colleen, both of them are uh, all-star players, uh, and Matt Beasler is having a terrific uh, few months with, with the U.S. national team. Uh, and then you have to consider the other depth. I mean, Seth Sinovic has been great. Um, their forwards have been solid. They've got great depth in the midfield. And uh, Jay Heaps talked today about, you know, making things go the revolution's way in Kansas City, and that's going to be very hard to do against uh, against Sporting KC. I think the first thing they have to do is avoid that really slow start. They've done that twice in a row now. They get away with it against DC. In my opinion, they're unlucky to not to get away with it uh, to not get away with it against Toronto. Against Kansas City, you cannot uh, fall asleep early. They will punish you, and then it'll be a long way back. Um, and you really can't fall behind against them. It has to be uh, even every step of the way. Um, that's my take on it. I think it's a really uh, hard game to get a result out of. I don't think it's impossible to by any means. Um, they've done very well on the road, but uh, it certainly will not be easy. You've got to be uh, strong off the get go and not let anything off easy because uh, that's, that's a team that they're going to pounce on uh, on anything. You know? Especially if, if, uh, if we let one in, it's going to be tough to come back against a team like KC. So we've got to be uh, tip top off the, off the game. You know, it's just a, it's down to us as players just making good decisions to start the game. Uh, as simple as that. You know, we have tactics that we, we follow to start games, and uh, us on the field have to do a better job of doing it and just uh, you know, making sure we're 110% ready to go when the whistle blows. I kind of agree with you as far as you know this team being a different team this year than it was last year on the road, especially a team last year that you know lost their first game in KC, then got a respectable tie midseason at Sporting KC. Uh, this is a team that's proven itself on the road, and I think this is a team that, you know, should they should expect nothing less than at least a point. They shouldn't be they shouldn't hold their, hold their heads up high for anything a close game, but they need to have a need to have a performance that, you know, they come away with something from this game. Especially this is this is a six point game. I mean, this is this is a game that these are the games that playoff teams win, where playoff teams get results out of. So 
Um, it'll be very interesting to see what kind of squad Peter Vermees unleashes, considering that they have the game uh, tonight uh, in Nicaragua, and also the fact that they may not have Sestinovic after uh, after his hit on Kosuke Kimura in, in that Red Bull game. And looking at a possible suspension, we haven't heard anything from the league, but you know it may be a very different squad than what we saw them roll out against uh, New York Red Bull. Um, so, you know, in, in saying that, uh, what, what, would, what would be your, your prediction for the game on Saturday? Uh, I, I think a fair result uh, for these two teams where they are right now would probably be a tie. Um, the Rebs have never won in uh, Sporting KC Park. I think it's an it's incredibly hard result and very coveted result to, to get. Um, I don't think a, a win um, by, by KC would be hard to match by any means, but I, I sort of see this being a tie. I think the Rebs are going to push very hard. Um, I do agree with you, though, that it, this is definitely a six-point game. I think when you look at the standings, you look at Houston right above you with a game in hand, that is very, very worrisome. They're ahead by three points, and three points uh, you know, in this Eastern Conference is quite a lot. Um, and the Rebs, it's kind of a blessing and a curse that all their remaining games are against Eastern Conference teams um, because, you know, as you've seen, you've seen the Rebs that can beat you know, the Columbus Crew and the Chicago Fire, and then turn around and tie the DC Uniteds and lose to the Toronto FCs. So, you know, you are hoping that the Revs that come out on Saturday against Kansas City are going to be the Revs that beat the Chicago's and the Columbus's, not the ones that lose to Toronto and tie DC. So that said, I think, you know, Jay Heaps has just has to get the consistency out of his players, has to have them focused, and I don't think that's going to be difficult for them to do by any means. They've done it before; they can certainly do it again. But, uh, like you said, it's a six-pointer; it's a big game. You know, I think Kansas City is so good at, at overwhelming, and, and you know, New York really did a nice job of finishing the chances. And, and so um, I think we, we need to create more as well. Um, and um, we have to be prepared for Kansas City to really you know, high press and, and really try to jam us and, um, and, and be ready to, to match them physically. What's the toughest thing about playing at Sporting KC Park? I think it's their pressure, you know, they, they pressure you uh, high and hard. Um, it's very tough to get out. They'll foul you in your own end, so uh, it's tough to really get in a rhythm and, and uh, you know, they push a lot of numbers forward, but at the same time, I think them pushing on numbers forward leaves them vulnerable in the counter sometimes, so if we take care of the ball and uh, take some of the chances that we do create, uh, we're confident that, that we can come out of there with a the result. And they're at home and they're going to try and come out and attack and uh, get three points and uh, that's that's uh, when you're playing away at, at KC like against a team like that. You know they're, they're going to lose spaces in the back. Like um, and then you, you saw how New York was able to take advantage of them. And that's what we're, we're hoping to do. I think Jay Heaps will have his squad ready for the game, no doubt. But it's uh, just a matter of execution. I mean, it it all goes back to you know games like Toronto and games like DC where they have the better of the play for a lot of stretches, but they just cannot find the back of the net. The final pass is missing, or you know the timing is just a little bit off. So I think that. Although they have the capability, they have the weapons to be able to go in there and get a result, I think it's a lot easier said than done for a team that, like Casey, that has the inherent home field advantage and a team that presses high and will punish a team on, on, you know, on the drop of a dime. So I look at this as a game that the Revs are going to be very, very hard pressed to get a result out of. I think it's a 2-1 score line. I think you'll see the Revs uh, come out strong. I'm not saying they're going to score, but I think they'll come out strong. Um, but I think that the high pressure that Sporting KC employs is just going to be too much. Uh, even for a defense like like the Revs, I think their uh, I think their defense will be tested. And I think their defense will be we have to the test for the most part. But um, but I, I think after a while, I think the deep, the pressure will get to them, and it's uh, and it may be proven to be too difficult for them to get points out of. So um, that'd be my prediction. It's two to one, and uh, so that wraps it up for us here at the Give and Go, presented by New England Soccer Today. For Julian Cardello, I'm Brian O'Connell.